Get out the insurance cards, get out the co-pays. The office is open, my friends. Brought to you by DrRoto.com. What is up and welcome in to a off the day we and show. We are your fast break of college basketball information. I am your host, Eric Romoff. You can catch me on those Twitter streets at Fantasy Nav. You can do your part in this endeavor. Scroll on over and smash those like and subscribe buttons. And he is not only the captain of our ship, he is also the ambassador of Quan as we are within 40 days to the start of tip off of the college basketball season. He is MC Holland 34 on Twitter. He is Mike Holland. Mike, how's it going today? It's going good, man. You hit it on the head, right? We got 40 days, 40 nights uh, to the college basketball tips. You know, our guy Jay Heinrich's been working hard, dropping our top 20 countdown for returning players uh, coming into the year. I believe we just posted number 14. I believe they'll have 13 coming out today. Um, if you haven't caught it also, we did an ACC preview, a Big 12 preview, Big 10 preview. Working on SEC, Pac-12, Big East, a lot of college basketball teams. But uh, it's an exciting time. There's more to come, obviously, as we get um, closer and closer to the season. Uh, but today we got a special giveaway. So why don't you tell the folks out there what the One and Done show is giving out for free to one lucky fan? Yeah, so we do have a giveaway going on for today. It is actually a Colin Sexton signed basketball the reason for this will make more sense momentarily. In order to get entered, all you have to do, make sure you're subscribed to the channel and then respond to the prompt here in our comments. Want to know who is your favorite Bama basketball player of all time? So that's super exciting, man. He just got traded. I'm going to Utah now, so should have definitely have a big role there. Um, one of the more exciting players to come through Bama. And we're excited to talk SEC hoops. We're going to head down to Tuscaloosa and cover a rising basketball program. Here to help us do that is Alabama beat reporter for AL.com and the Birmingham News, Mike Rodak. Mike, thanks for joining us. How are you today? I'm doing well, guys. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. We're, we are thrilled to have you here, and we are pumped to talk about some, some tied hoops. One of our favorite programs to cover all throughout the course of last season. Definitely have a lot of things to be excited about for the season to come. I, I guess kind of starting off, Mike, uh, like we talked about now a few times, we're about a month away from the tip-off of the season, and I want to get your thoughts on how last year played out and specifically how how it ended, right? Uh, Coach Oates and this Alabama team were a ton of fun to watch and to cover. Team really seemed to have it going, and then they close out the year on a four-game losing streak. So I want to know from your perspective, you know, what what really happened on that uh, at the tail end of that season, and, and how would you grade Coach Oates through three seasons? Yeah, it's definitely, a, I think, a disappointing season for a lot of fans around here, especially coming off of what they did the year before, which was somewhat unexpected for them to make the Sweet 16 and kind of have it all come together in year two for Oates. I think a lot of people went into year three thinking that was kind of going to be how it was. And even Oates at the beginning of the year last year was sort of warning people that to do that every year is really hard, and they sort of weren't at that level yet. And it played out. They just weren't. They weren't that good on defense compared to what they, they were the year before. I don't think there's as much team chemistry and um, just a really frustrating team to watch for, for a lot of fans um, in, in the way that they lost some games that they, they should have won, um, you know, at Missouri and Georgia and Iona they lost to. You win those three games, and this is something that Oates has talked about. They probably get a better seed in the tournament, and maybe they don't draw Notre Dame. You know, maybe things go a little bit differently, but at the end of the day, they, they lost games that they should have won. Um, and they had, even with beating Baylor and beating Gonzaga and um, some of the big wins that they had, Houston, there that was offset by by some of the bad losses that they had. It was just a very inconsistent, uneven team that you go, you know, the last regular season game against LSU, J.D. Davison not realizing that the shot clock was expiring and dribbling the ball out um, as, as time basically expired on them. Um, stuff like that that I think people just – wanted to throw something at their TV watching this team, thinking that they could be better than what they were. But at the same time, there was still, again, that ceiling where you don't have Herb Jones, you don't have some of the pieces that they had the year before. Um, you know, expectations probably should have been tempered a little bit more going into the year. And um, But overall, that's, that's the product of success. And that's something that Oates has talked about too, where expectations have been raised so much around here where a season where they were, you know, fifth seed in the tournament is considered bad. <laughs> Um, or considered disappointment, whereas maybe five years ago that would have been good. That would have been progress for him. So 
I think the, the biggest accomplishment that Oates has made at Alabama so far is just raising those expectations and sort of generating that excitement that people think that they're going to watch something special each season. Yeah, I think you hit it after watching that Gonzaga game last year. It's kind of hard not to have those huge expectations, um, only to kind of see the end of the year go that way. But still building a, a great thing there. And just going to kind of move here to the offseason and talk about uh, this roster. You know, this team loses some key pieces. Jaden Shackelford is not going to be there. You talked about J.D. Davison. Um, he's gone. But Quinterly's back and Charles Bidiaco. So, you know, how important is it to get these two guys back at the point and center position? And, you know, can they step forward as leaders on this team? Yeah, so starting with Quinterly, you know, obviously he's coming off the ACL um, that he suffered against uh, Notre Dame in that, that tournament game that they lost. So his recovery, it's it's on track by, by all accounts, um, but he won't be back probably until some point in December is what they seem to be targeting. Um, SEC play has been always the, the milestone for him in order to get back, but there's been some word from Oates lately that maybe it's a couple games before that. So maybe he's back for that Gonzaga game that they play on December 17th. Um, I think the big question with him is, is he a starter when he comes back? And that's to be answered. I think a lot of that's going to depend on how Mark Sears plays, a, a guy that we'll get into later, the transfer from Ohio, uh, who will be their starting point guard to start the year. Um, Cornerly came off the bench, you might remember, two years ago when they had that Sweet 16 team and probably should have been sixth man of the year in the SEC. I think it, it went to somebody else, but he had a pretty strong case and he seemed to really relish in that role coming off the bench and shot really well. And was kind of that burst of energy and getting to the basket. And then last year he was a starter and his three point shooting dropped off dramatically. It was down about 15 percentage points and still had that, that ability to get to the rim. And he's probably as good as anybody in college basketball in doing that, but his defensive effort lapsed at, at some points and he got benched for the start of the Vanderbilt game for eight minutes uh, by Oates. And there was some, you know, consternation there that you could sense. So it, it's going to be a question of whether he starts. And I think in order for him to start, he's going to have to shoot well. And that's something Oates has, has already said that, you know, he's, he's going to need to shoot to play. He's also going to need to defend to play. And that goes with everybody else in the roster. I think Oates is really trying to send that message this year that if you don't defend, if you don't guard, he's not going to play you. So I could easily see him being a sixth, seventh man when he comes back and, and being one of the best five players, but maybe not being a starter. Uh, with Betty Yako, I think he will be a starter. You know, he's some he gives them something they don't really have otherwise in terms of being that seven foot shot blocking presence. They didn't really have that the first couple of years under Oates. They got it with him last year as a borderline five star prospect. And there were some games where I think he showed it. You know, I think he handled Oscar Sheba really well. Uh, that first Kentucky game that was played in Tuscaloosa. But there's other games where Betty Yako was soft, quite frankly. And that was something that. Oates talked about where he needed to put on some weight this offseason. And some of his teammates talked about how they wanted to see angry Chuck, as they called him, sort of a guy who's more aggressive and gets the rebounds and is more, uh, you know, just front and facing on defense and getting in your face a little bit. So, you know, he's a guy who's going to, I think, will need to take a step this year. He's got the talent. He's going to start. He's going to play a lot of minutes at center. But, you know, I think there's definitely something to be desired with, with Charles Bediaco still. Yeah, going back to to your point on on Quinterly, I mean, absolute gut punch to see him uh, go down with injury that way. Was certainly rooting for him to make a full and speedy recovery. And honestly, you know, the the fact that he doesn't walk right back into a starting role really speaks to the talent that's on this roster. And we don't have to look back really far at all, right? We look at Remy Martin with Kansas last year to see just how impactful a a, a pop player coming off of the bench like Quinterly can can be on a on a team's ability to make a deep run. So we'll certainly be watching those two storylines that you mentioned. And you cued me up, you talked about Mark Thiers. This team has been really effective and really busy in the transfer portal. They brought in some really strong guard talent. Mark Sears coming in from Ohio, Dom Welch coming in from St. Bonaventure. So from from your point of view, at least from your vantage, you know, what what has been Coach Oates's strategy when it comes to the transfer portal? And what sort of roles do you see these incoming transfers playing in this upcoming season? Yeah, he's been very open with the portal, even going back to, you know, the previous rules or before some of the relaxation that's gone on in the last couple of years here where Beetle Bolding came in his first year and then his second year, um, Jordan Bruner came in and then last year, Noah Gurley. So he's brought in a, a portal guy every year and it expanded this year in part because he lost five guys to the portal and there was sort of a, a churning of the roster that went, went on this offseason. I think there's certainly some guys that 
you know, there, like I said, there's issues of team chemistry last year and, and just sort of the overall culture of the team. And I think, you know, they tried to fix that through the portal. And I think it allows them to bring in veteran experience, which is something that Oates always talks about. He says veterans win in college basketball. And as much as they want to bring in the talented five-star freshmen, which they have, you still need some guys who have sort of been around and have that basketball IQ and have that leadership ability. And that's, I think, what why they, they go to the portal. And that's what they got out of Mark Sears and, and Dom Wells specifically. And, you know, they needed guards who can shoot too. That was a big issue for them last year was their three-point shooting. If, if you're going to be a team that plays up-tempo and shoots a lot of threes as they are and they will continue to be under Nate Oates, you still got to hit them. And last year they were sub 300th in the country in doing that, which was a big issue. Um, so you, you bring in a couple guys who they, they think can shoot. Um, Mark Sears is from Alabama. I think that, that certainly helped them in, in the recruiting of him out of the portal. He, he's from Muscle Shoals, Alabama, so you're bringing him back home. Dom Welch is from Buffalo, which is where Nate Oates and his top assistant, Brian Hodgson, are from and uh, obviously have a lot of ties to, and he went to St. Bonaventure. So sort of their, their old backyard, their old stomping grounds, and I think that was certainly an advantage for them getting him. Um, so, you know, he's, he's a swing two or three. I think he'll play a lot of minutes. I don't know if he'll necessarily start, but I, I think he'll be one of their top seven guys. Um, and a guy too, who can bring that leadership ability as well. So, um, it's going to be a team that relies on transfers, I think every year to some extent, and that's, that's probably not going to change. Yeah. That same Bonaventure team was, um, pretty talented last year. I know we got Lofton going to Florida, so Alabama will be taking him on, but, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what Welch does this year. I think he's got some talent. I'm definitely looking to you know see what he does, but there's more new faces arriving. I think we get excited whenever we hear you know the five star freshmen um, that are coming in. You know, this recruiting class finished in the top ten, uh, 24/7 composite. So you know we've been hearing a lot about Brandon Miller this summer. Is he a potential X factor for this team? Is there anyone else in this recruiting class that you think uh, could step up and fill a role? Yeah, Brandon Miller, I think, has generated a ton of buzz even around here. They had an open practice. They had 10 practices before they made their foreign trip. They went to Spain and France this summer. They played three games over there, one against the, the Chinese national team, and all three games, Brandon Miller was their leading scorer. So a guy who, and really Oates' words, can play one through five. Um, he's probably more of a two through four, depending on how big or small their lineup's going to be. Um, but he's 6'9", he can move, he can shoot, he can score, he can defend. He, he really checks a lot of boxes for him. He's a guy who very easily could be a first round lottery pick um, next year as a one and done type of guy. So I would not be sh surprised or shocked in any way if he's their leading scorer at the end of the season. I would not be surprised if he's some sort of all SEC or all America type pick. I mean, I think he's a guy who has a, a huge ceiling um, and they've already sort of seen that and they've talked about it so far. And um, they're counting on him a lot as a freshman, even, you know, to provide a, a lot of scoring for them and a lot of shooting for him. And, um, I think he's the guy who's going to do it. He's, he's the guy who's most ready to do it out of that recruiting class. But with that said, they also brought in another McDonald's All-American and, and Jaden Bradley, uh, you know, smaller point guard type who you'll have to see exactly what his role is going to be because of Sears coming in and starting at the point. And then you have Quinterly back, who's another point guard type. You, you do have to wonder where exactly the minutes will come from from Jaden Bradley. He did have a foot injury over the summer. Uh, that slowed him down a little bit. And, you know, they've talked about kind of building his confidence back up and getting his shot down. So there's probably more of a, a learning curve for him in terms of playing big time minutes and playing a big time role right away. But another guy who's, you know, really highly rated and highly regarded. And maybe at the end of the year, we're talking about him as one of their top six or seven players, too. Yeah, certainly a lot of talent on this roster and plenty of guys that can take, take a step forward. It sounds like Mike likes the incoming recruiting class, uh, namely Brandon Miller, to potentially step forward as that X Factor. If you're checking in with us on YouTube, first and foremost, hit those like and subscribe buttons. And then we want to hear from you. Who on this roster do you think can potentially take a step forward and be an X Factor for the Tide this year? Mike, you you teed it up perfectly earlier. You talked a lot about uh, the, the scheme and the style of play that, that Nate Oates likes to trot out there. Last year, this team played at a lightning fast pace, 11th in tempo. And as tends to be the case with a lot of up-tempo teams, a little bit of difficulty knocking down uh, shots from the perimeter, a little bit of difficulty taking care of the ball. So do you think that this team uh, and this roster is able to 
improve in those areas? And, and will Coach Oates continue to push the pace this year? Yeah, he will definitely continue to push the pace. He's almost stubborn uh, to a point with, with how he likes to stick to his style and stick to his um, philosophy in terms of how to play basketball. And he's going to find players who will play that style more than he will change his style to fit the players. Um, and, you know, that's that's worked, I think, to varying extents his, his first couple of seasons. It worked really well two years ago. I don't think it worked as well last year uh, with a guy like J.D. Davidson, who just never really seemed to be comfortable playing in that offense, kind of coming from a lower level of high school basketball in Alabama, just never really made that transition. And as we kind of saw with his his draft stock, I mean, he fell from a lottery pick down to a late second round pick. So turnovers were a big reason too. I mean, he was a turnover machine at Alabama last year and that was their part of their problem. And um, I don't know if that's automatically fixed by having Mark Sears in there or having Quinterly playing a lot at the point or having Jaden Bradley, but it's something that they do need to do better. Um, but Oates is not going to shy away from playing his style. He essentially says, you know, if, if there's five or six, seven turnovers a game, it's fine. Like he's just, he's fine. Just kind of giving those points away or giving those, turnovers away and getting what he thinks he'll get out of his offense and just sort of having that um, cushion, if you will, where he's okay with a certain amount of turnovers. He's okay with a certain amount of sloppiness if he's getting the scoring and, and the pace on the back end that he needs. So um, I don't think there's going to be any changes style wise. I think the, what he wants to see change is the, the shooting efficiency. You know, if you can shoot better than they shot last year, even one or two or three more made three pointers per game, that's a big difference in terms of some of the close games that they played three or six points is the deciding factor in a lot of those games. And that's all it really took. Um, but there's so many games where they just shot so poorly that they just kind of climb out of that hole. Yeah. We talk about how important it is not only in the NBA game, but the college basketball game, the three point shot, that can really be a difference maker. We saw that with Kansas last year, um, being able to knock down those outside shots, but just want to zoom out a little bit from the X's and O's and talk about a, Something that we can't get away from with college athletics, and that's NIL. I um, just want to get your thoughts on this Crimson Tide program's handled this new landscape, and you know what are some things that this program is doing on this front, and how does this market compare to the other schools in the SEC? Yeah, it's still, I think, an uphill battle for the basketball program versus football, and even for football. I mean, I've talked about this in the wake of the whole Nick Saban, Jimbo Fisher uh, spat where you know, the football program still had to compete more with Miami and what they have with John Ruiz and having a billionaire down there and what Texas A&M has uh, because of the Houston market, and the Dallas market, um, what USC has because of the, the LA market. Like Alabama just doesn't have that corporate base. I mean, Birmingham is a smaller city. There's one Fortune 500 company in Alabama, and it's just a little bit tougher to kind of find that money. There's certainly passion among fans, but maybe not the deep-pocketed, billionaires that you need to, to fund some of this stuff. So it's going to have to be more grassroots. Um, I think the big question for fans right now, and a lot of fans have been clamoring for a new basketball arena at Alabama, and they came out last year with some drawings for one, and they said that they were they got approved by the Board of Trustees, the first step of approval um, to build this new basketball arena. It's going to cost X number of millions of dollars, but now there's chatter that is that money better served going towards NIL, if you're going to really pull it out, out of the donors and get all that money to build an arena, which is tough. Like Greg Byrne, the, the AD down here has talked about how much they need to get out of the donors. And he says he needs a lot of amens from the church body in order to get the money to do that. If that money's going to an arena, is that money better served going towards NIL? And I think that's the question that they're sort of grappling with in terms of if you're going to get the best players, I think we all know NIL is going to go a long way there. Um, so that's that's a big question. And, and kind of where does that money come from right now? But, you know, I don't think they're ever going to be getting the same sort of NIL money that Kentucky will or even Tennessee or Florida or some of the more traditional basketball markets. I think if there is NIL money at Alabama, it's more often than not going to go to football. And that's just something that I think Nate Oates is going to have to just deal with if he doesn't go somewhere else eventually. Um that's just how it is here. And it, it's going to be really tough to overcome even in the long term. Yeah. I mean, this, this program has been playing very, very well for the last couple of years. And even with that far cry from over, from surpassing the the football program in terms of attention and, and donorship uh, on, on the basketball side. And if, if anyone hasn't seen them yet, some of those mock-ups on the new arena out there are 
absolutely slick. I, I think it would be such a cool space to play in, but fair point that maybe that money going directly to the athletes might have a more immediate impact. Um, we've talked a bit about the uh, the other teams that you're competing against in the SEC, at least in the NIL context, but you know, generally speaking, this is widely considered to be one of the toughest basketball conferences in the country. So I want to know from you, Mike, what needs to happen for, for this Crimson Tide team to compete for an SEC regular title? And who are some of the favorites that are kind of standing in their way? Yeah, I mean, it, I think Kentucky and Auburn are the two teams that stand out first to me going back two years ago because that helped Alabama in winning the SEC regular season for the first time in 19 years and then winning the tournament for the first time in 30 years was Kentucky having a down year two years ago, the COVID year, and Auburn, you know, having all their issues with, you know, probation or whatever that year that helped Alabama. And then last year, we kind of saw the tables turn back the other direction where Auburn's really good again, Kentucky's really good again, and Alabama went 0-4 against those two teams last year. And that was, I think, a big reason why they were – seed a little bit lower in the tournament they could have been a three or four seed in the tournament if they had just won one or two of those games and i think if you're talking about them how do they win the sec you probably got to win three of those games if you, obviously you're playing auburn twice i think they only play kentucky once this year i would have to double check but you got to win though you got to beat the best teams and at auburn in this state there's a lot of more attention on auburn um there's more of a recent history i'd say with auburn of success and There's sort of that it doesn't happen in football. It's the other way around in football. But in in this case, Alabama is a little brother in basketball, and you sort of have to beat up on the old brother and kind of hand it to him. So um, that is a team that stands in their way, and and that's something I'll have to deal with this year. Um, You know, Tennessee obviously is always going to be around. I had a big win against Tennessee two years ago that sort of started to spring their run towards the Sweet 16. They beat Arkansas last year, which is a pretty big win in terms of even getting them into the tournament as they were um, seeded and probably Florida. It seems like Florida's fringe top 25 team this, this year as well. So, um, you know, it's going to be tr- the traditional schools, but if, if you're Alabama, you got to have the talent to do it, which I think they do this year with Brandon Miller, probably a little bit more than they did last year with JD Davidson in terms of having that top flight talent like Auburn did last year with Jabari Smith or Kentucky did with Shibway. You got to have that, player that the other team wants the game plan against or needs the game plan against and you got to have players too who just can play sound fundamental basketball with with good iq and that's something they didn't have last year but two years ago i think they had a lot more of yeah i think brandon miller definitely gives them that upside along with mark sears and bidiaco on the defensive end um so definitely a, a team to watch but uh bull prediction time you know what's the ceiling for nate oats in year four and what seed do you got this team um, when they enter the NCAA tournament, yeah. So I think you know I don't think winning the SEC is out of out of the question. You know I think this is a team that's proven they can do that um, with the system that they play. If they can get guys bought in, and I think they have the talent to do it this year. And the guy we haven't even talked about is Namari Burnett, um, who could be their starting two guard, who was another McDonald's All American, another five star guy who transferred from Texas Tech and then tore his ACL and missed all last season. So you have him in the backcourt, Sears, Miller, um, you had Bediaco, and there's some other pieces around. Like, that's a talented basketball team. Like, I I could see them winning the SEC, but, again, it's going to take beating some of the SEC's best teams, and that's something they didn't do last year. But even with that said, I think there's still the expectation, I think, among fans that they'll finish in the top three or four in the conference and, and try to make a run in the tournament, which they didn't do last year. They lost to Vandy in the first round. Um, and then get into the NCAA tournament as a top four seed. You know, I think whether you're talking a two seed or a four seed probably is going to depend on can you beat Gonzaga and add that to your resume? Can you beat Houston, who they play on the road this year, and add that to your resume? Um, They have the Phil Knight tournament where they'll play Michigan State and maybe UConn. I think North Carolina is out there as well who they could play. So you have the teams on their schedule. Nate Oates is going to schedule – as hard as any coach in the country, and he believes in that. Um, but you got to win some of those games, and then your net ranking, I think, will reflect that in terms of your strength of schedule, which is what happened last year. I mean, their record overall was not great last year, but they were seeded so highly in the tournament because of their strength of schedule and some of their big wins. Mike Rodak absolutely dialed in to all things Alabama hoops 
all things Alabama, if we're being fair. If you are not already, get over to Twitter and follow him. It is scrolling along the bottom of your screen right now, at Mike Rodak. Check out all of his great work at AL.com. Mike, really appreciate you spending some time with us after this afternoon and getting us up to speed on all things Roll Tide. You got it, guys. Thanks, Thanks for having Mike. me out again. It's again, so Mike, we do have a couple other things to clean up here, a bit of news since the last time that we had uh, a one-and-done show. We've been doing a lot of these conference previews, so haven't been able to drill down on some of the happenings around the league. Uh, what's the uh, What's the biggest update that you want to lead off with? Yeah, so I think the updates right now, 40 days away from the season and, and basically practices starting are going to be the injury news that we're coming up with. Um, you know, all the movement and everything, transfer portal, that was all summer. Um, so now we're finding out with media availability and different things like that, who's available, how long people are going to be out for. And the first one I want to start with is Xavier. Zach Fremantle was suspended indefinitely, so kind of raising some eyebrows. Um, you know, practice started Tuesday and he wasn't in attendance. He was uh, Head coach Sean Miller was asked, you know, what the deal was. And he's just been suspended indefinitely uh, from team activities right now. You know, this is a guy that started 57 games. He's a key piece to what they want to do. It's obviously a tough Big East. So um, we don't know how long he's going to be out for, if it's going to be a few games or, or what that looks like. So until we get more clarification, obviously a little bit tougher to project how this is going to affect Xavier's season. Um, but last year, you know, dealt with an injury. Still came out close to 10 points and five boards, but I think he's more of a 14, 15 point guy. Um, it can get you about seven or eight rebounds. Uh, so, yeah, this is uh, something to monitor. What are, what are your thoughts on this Fremantle news? Yeah, it's it's curious, right? Like to 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 see that he's been suspended indefinitely and to not really get, um, you know, any further clarification on the reasoning behind it. It's, it's definitely a head scratcher. You know, it's it's the boat that we're in. So while we're here, I mean, wheels up on on Jack Nungy, right? This was a guy that we loved to target and play in the DFS game last year, um, expecting to have an even brighter spotlight on him heading into the season as it was. And now if we're going to see Fremantle off the court for a period of time, that, that only grows exponentially, right? So bit of a head scratcher. Um, but Xavier has a really talented roster. They can certainly make some noise if they are without Fremantle for some period of time to be named later. Uh, you mentioned injuries off the top. A uh, bit of a bummer on the BYU front. Let's uh, let's update everyone with what's going on with uh, with Trevin Nell. Yeah, so Trevin Nell um, was actually giving an interview. They were asking him about his shoulder, um, which he had hurt the first game last year. He was able to play through it. And he announced that he has a partially torn rotator cuff um, that's going to require shoulder surgery. And he's going to be out three to four months. I mean, this is a guy that can really knock down shots, um, had some good games towards the end of the year, even when he was injured. Uh, so this is a big blow to a BYU team that's expected to kind of be in that next tier after Gonzaga um, in that West Coast Conference. He's going to probably be that sixth man role. Might have started. Um, you know, kind of kind of interesting to see how they're going to be able to fill that void. But, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on, on Nell missing some time here? Yeah, I mean, how they're going to fill that void is is the question, right? Like, they, they've got Rudy Williams coming in from Coastal Carolina. He's one of your top 100 transfers on your big board over at drroto.com. I mean, presumably, he's the most likely candidate to kind of step up. He's, he's the most prolific scorer of the kind of remaining lot there. We've got some other, you know, transfers coming in. Uh, you know, Jackson Robinson from from Arkansas. Spencer Johnson might might be able to step up, but... Ultimately, I mean this this team was going to was going to go as Trevin Nell goes, and for him to be out for such a stretch, right? We're basically not not really going to be talking about him until we get into twenty twenty three. Um, you know, really really puts a damper on the expectations for this BYU program. The last piece of news that we want to hit is coming out of Washington State. Another indefinite situation. This one for medical reasons. What's going on up in the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, so it came out that the big man, Deshaun Jackson, um, going to be out indefinitely for medical reasons. We don't quite know what that means. Um, looked at his Twitter, uh, just had a really nice post about the fans asking to respect his privacy um, and to not, you know, he didn't want to be a distraction. So it seems like he could be out for a while. Um, honestly, we're just now getting some of this news with all the practices kind of starting up. So, you know, he's projected to be a starter last year. He had, you know, some nice games last year, really flashed. Um, averaged six points, four rebounds, and over a block last year. Um, this was supposed to be a big front line for Washington State. I mean, you had uh, Mohamed Gee and him kind of being like that 6'10", 6'11", kind of a throwback situation, um, shot blockers, you know, 
uh, banging it down inside the post. But uh, now they're probably going to have to utilize Andrzej uh, Yakimovsky um, at that four spot. So, you know, Yakimovsky is going to have a lot to um, essentially fill with the, the loss of Jackson here. So, um, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, the the depth really becomes the the, the biggest question, right? You, you mentioned it right behind uh, right behind Jackson and, and Gee. Not really a whole lot that I think can step in to play that style of basketball that they're wanting to up in Washington State. So, um, you know, this this one certainly stings for this program. Um, whatever the issue might be, we obviously hope that uh, it is a speedy and full recovery for. Uh, for Jackson himself, and that uh, covers the latest round of news around the college basketball world. Again, forty days out. Before you know it, we're gonna have we're gonna have that ball tipping up in the air, and we're gonna get some live action in the college basketball ranks. If you have not already, scroll on over, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, because that is how you will be entered to win a Colin Sexton autographed basketball. We'll be giving that out here on Saturday, so. Anyone who's not watching live, you do have an opportunity to get in and to win that basketball. Need to be subscribed. Need to answer this question. Who is your favorite Bama basketball player of all time? The other things that you need to be doing, you need to get over to drroto.com. You need to get yourself subscribed. We talk about Mike's big board all the time. We talk about some of his work previewing different teams and different conferences. All that information is available to you as a subscriber. You also get access to our members-only Discord where you can have on-demand, up-to-the-minute conversations with myself, with Mike, with the entire team, not only for college basketball, which is obviously why you're here, but all of the various sports that are out there. We cover every single thing under the sun, but specifically for college basketball, get into that Discord, and let's get this bread. Thanks for stopping by the office. Get your fantasy prescription by subscribing to the channel and checking out drrodo.com. And until the next visit, be well and take care.